Greetings, epic adventure seekers. I'm Allie Bierman, your guide to demystifying your world. And I'm so grateful you're here with us today on Let's Get Metaphysical Connecting Heart and Mind. Today's guest, Miriam Rose Cohn, is like no other person I've ever, ever known. And so it is my great honor to be introducing her. And before jumping into this new adventure, and I do mean adventure, I have a question for you. What do you like most about our show? What do you want to know more about? Seriously, I, I want to know you. I want to know what you want. I want to know what you like about it. And I want to talk to you, in fact, I'd love for you to be a guest. Yeah, and there'll be a link in the show note so that you can contact me and we can make that happen. Miriam Rose Cohn classifies her business as a life-changing career transition coach. Oh my, she is so much more than that, which is why I could hardly wait to share her with you. And after chatting with her and getting to know who she truly is, it's like, I can't really, I, I'm just bubbling with excitement, in case she couldn't tell. She told me her story, and I never did this before, but I wanted to share with you uh, how she described what she does and why she does it in her own words. And what she said was, I had to go through a career transition twice in my life. So when I talk about career transition, I've walked the road myself and I know what it takes, how scary it is on your own and where the pitfalls lie. She works in three languages. She speaks five languages. She knows everything every detail anyone needs to begin a new career. And I mean everything, every aspect, every skill. Her brilliant work, her resumes have appeared in 35 books and also on careerjournal.com. Now speaking five languages, it may be no surprise she's an accredited translator who works for the courts and the U.S. Department of Justice. So much more to know. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our show, Miriam Rose Kong. Thank you so much for having me, Ali. I'm honored to be part of you, the amazing work that you do. Thank you. Thank you for coming, man. When I talked to you that day and we were chatting, it's like, I can't wait to get you on the show. I was a little disappointed I had to wait a few weeks, but you're here now. I am here now. <laughs> Thank you. Something that is it's immediately obvious to me, but it might not be to others. Would you please share the amazing journey that brought you to the United States, because people born in the U.S. don't usually work in three languages, speak five languages, and have a slight accent. So, <laughs> yes, how did I you do. get here? Uh, I uh, came here well many, many years ago in the late '60s, actually, um, to have a better life, and I. Uh, worked 52 hours a week while I put myself through school. So uh, it was first junior college and then the state university. And even though um, I had I'd so self-financed my education is what it was because I wanted to be a professor. And um, yeah, it took me uh, six years, but I did it. I graduated with a double major in for my bachelor's. And then uh, also graduated with honors for uh, my master's with my master's. And then I married and had children. So I kind of put a hole on it, everything. But then I went back and I, I eventually I did become an adjunct professor at university and taught it for more than 20 years over there. Yes. And even though I have an accent, as you mentioned, I'm sure people can hear, 
it doesn't show up on paper. So I was able to teach English. I'm able to write resumes and nobody's uh, any the wiser. <laughs> yeah, so what, where did you learn English? Did you, where, where did oh. you grow up that you had to know so many languages? <laughs> well, uh, I was born and raised in Belgium and in the Northern part, I come from Antwerp and it's mostly a transient country. At the time I went to business school and in those days, we had to do uh, non-defunct skills, I guess, but we had to do shorthand typing in French, Dutch, English, and German before we could graduate. So that's where I learned it. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I had my basics over there because I had a very thorough education in all these languages and other things, yes. So was it common for people, if they weren't in a program like that, to know those different languages? You will find that most people speak at least the French, the Dutch, and the English over there in the northern part. Southern part, they may speak English. They don't do Dutch very well, <laughs> uh, mostly because they don't want to. But uh, those who do, do learn it. Uh, most people speak English in, well, I can only speak Western Europe. That's where I'm have my most of my experience in and keep up with for my international clients. So that's my uh, expertise. So I can tell you most people will speak English over there. Yes. So I imagine that's a really big advantage being able to speak the different languages because you can actually have international clients and work with them in different languages. I do, and you mentioned I'm a translator, and it's very good for people who want to move around internationally, because yes, even though they speak English, if you offer your resume in a different language, at least they know that you're willing to be adaptable and acculturated, because that's a big thing. I mean, it's not like you get culture shock when you get off a plane in uh, Paris or Brussels, you know, or Berlin or, or Frankfurt or wherever you're going. <laughs> or Rome, or Madrid, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not a big culture shock, but you soon will learn that after being there for a few days, people view life differently than we do here in the United States. And it's not to say that one is better than the other, it's just to point out that there are differences. And so, you know, they tend to enjoy life. Why is it they have time to take a cup of coffee and a piece of pastry in the afternoon where we do not, <laughs> you know, here in the United States. And so you, you learn that they view life differently. And um, which means they also have many more holidays, are days on which they do not work. So if you're a project manager, let's say, and you're used to working in the United States, if you go over there, you're going to have to change your plans slightly because you might need more time to get the project completed. People observe their holidays very seriously over there. So, and you can't ask them. As a matter of fact, they just passed a law in Belgium last month that said that managers are no longer allowed to uh, contact their employees after hours. Employees are entitled to their time. <laughs> so, you know, they'll never work in the United States, but that's how they do it over there. So if you do want to move around, you, you have to adapt. You have to acculturate because you want to get the cooperation of the natives, as it were, or you're not going to get anywhere with your work. So, yeah. But I... I kind of knew all those things that you were saying, but I didn't really bring them totally into my awareness. I, know I have a good friend in New Zealand, and I spent three months in her home many years ago, and I was aware that people were coming from, I'm trying to remember which countries, it might have been England and Japan, they were coming for their vacations for a month. And oh, yes. It, yeah, and... and it's no wonder the U.S., one of the richest countries in the world, actually our health is like, last time I looked, it was like 47th in the world because we're also one of the sickest countries for mm -hmm. all the points that you just said that I wasn't really thinking about before. I remember going to Santa Fe many years ago and we went out for lunch and after lunch, 
couldn't shop in any of the stores because they were all closed for their siesta. That's right. <laughs> People take care of themselves. As you were saying, they enjoy life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and on that topic, you and I were talking before we started recording about we share the same philosophy. If it's not fun, don't do it. Could you please explain how that shows up in the work that you do with people? Thank you. Yes. Um, So for more than 20 years now where I've been coaching uh, people uh, with their work, so many people are miserable and unhappy in their work. And there's no need for that, Uh, especially since the pandemic, because the employment market has changed so much. There's no need to be miserable or unhappy. You can get paid for work you enjoy to do, and you'll have a much happier life, a more harmonious life. The clients I used to have were miserable at work. They would not change, but they would go home and get rid of their spouses and significant others instead of doing it the other way around. You know, you when you get up in the morning, it's not awful. You know, that's why I don't like the word job. I think position is a lot better. A job is, I got to go. I don't want to, but I got to go. Well, now you don't have to have these feelings. And for those people who don't know what they like to do, we do career exploration first to make sure they're on the right track. And it can be you're still an employee for someone else, or it can be you become an entrepreneur. But if you get paid for work you enjoy to do, you have fewer headaches, you have lower blood pressure, which means fewer diseases, and you do get to enjoy life. And it's very important for your health and everything else. You know, so uh, that's what motivated to go. That's what motivated me to go into that direction. Absolutely. Um, I found once my children were grown that I'm really a nurturer and an educator. And so that's what I do with my clients now, because literally I know how scary this journey can be if you're alone. And I'm there to figuratively hold their hand till they reach their goal. They have someone who confides in, they can confide to. And um, not only am I they confident, but they can be assured that I have their best interest at heart. You know, you can go to resume mills and you can go to other people who do a lot of marketing, but don't really have their clients' interest at heart (laughs) and I do I think it's very important the connection with people and um, we make sure they're on track sometimes if something happens okay we have to discuss what it is and how we can get past it and move on with the work having said that if people are um, if people are drug addicts or alcoholics I cannot help them they have to be mentally fit first and then we can work. Um, and it's simply because I'm not trained to work with those type of people. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying they have no wolf. I'm sure they do once we can get past their addictions. But I, uh, I, I'm not trained in, the, in those areas. So that's why I cannot help them. But anybody else, I certainly can. Men, women, it does not matter. As a matter of fact, I even recommend to my clients that if they have children who are going to start college, or university to have a talk to make sure they're on the right track so they don't lose all that time and money. So there are many applications for my work, but yes, that's what brought me to that book. Because I, 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 I really, I think we need to have a betterment of our lives in this world. You know, if you are content and you go home, you don't pick up guns, right? Like we have so many mass shootings now. I mean, that's not going to happen if you are a happy person right yes and you feel you have a purpose in life i think these people are lost souls and if you know you have a purpose in life and you work toward it then that's a big part of having a healthier life as you mentioned and when you're happy at work and you're happy when you come home you're impacting everybody and everything in the house exactly you 
and add to the hazard because it has a ripple effect, right? It goes out too. Yes, absolutely. I love the point that you made about paying attention to your kids who are going to college because I know a lot of people don't agree with me, but I think college is one of the worst places for most people. You look in the U.S., 15% of people actually work in the field. They got their college degree, but I don't know how much it costs to go to college these days. I went a long time ago. It cost me $4,000. I think it's more like 70000 now to go for a year. <laughs> well, and I think the education needs uh, some serious reform because they're really not preparing their graduates for the work world, you know the world in which they have to work. Maybe that makes more sense. Yes. Yeah, they, they have to do some serious reforms in there. And it's not to say there's no need for college because uh, I was a musician and musicians tend to be like mathematicians or physics students or things like that. So yeah, I want an engineer to get an engineering degree if they're going to build anything. So for having everything appropriate and looking to see how it all fits together. And I love that you look at the big picture because there's so many people out there saying, I'm a transformation coach. Well, if you're a coach and you're not trying to get a transformation, what the heck are you doing? Right. Well, the way it really gets me, oh, I'm heart-centered. It doesn't mean anything, but you gave such a detailed description of how you work with your clients and for them. And if I'm gonna go get some coaching, I want it to be somebody like you who addresses, who could be like a confidant. And it's, that's gonna make a really big difference whether or not somebody succeeds. Right, right, absolutely. Cause they have someone to turn to. They don't have to flounder, you know? Yeah, so, uh, and I, I wanna, go into some more detail in just a moment and take a quick sponsor break. How to be happy, healthy, and secure. It's all in the book I wrote. You got to ask questions. Now, when I wrote this book years ago, I sold the book for $97 because people don't ask themselves the types of questions that are in there. It's not your standard type stuff. And people would write to me with their, I never asked for testimonials. I didn't know back then. And they would say, I made this change and that change. And I'm so glad you said this and that. So what I've done, I don't charge 97 for the book anymore. In fact, I also made an audio book and I have a set. It's a gift for you. And the link will be in the show notes where you can get it at that special price. Take me up on it because I'm also going to offer something I used to do all the time. When you get one of my products, I offer a live. Now we get to do Zoom. It used to be a telephone call where you can ask your questions, your observations, so that I know that you're actually using and understanding the book, because I don't want anybody buying anything that just sits on their shelf. And now getting back to, a, a, to our amazing guest here, you were talking about all the languages you speak and that you got to work as an interpreter. And I know that I once knew someone who was an interpreter for the president of the United States. And I used to wonder, how do we know that the interpreters aren't the people that are creating the world climate and the actual agreements? And because you have experience in that area, could you share your take on that? Well, first of all, uh, translators, let me point something out to our, your listeners, is translators, do work with the written word, interpreters with the spoken word. So two different set of skills and you have to be, I mean, the rigorous training. But the, the point is that uh, years ago, President Reagan had an interpreter and he misinterpreted one word and they had to scramble to get things right. We almost had a world incident. So 
They do very important work <laughs> and they have to be very, very well trained. I don't think they're the ones setting policies, but they can certainly cause major incidents if they don't do their <laughs> work properly. <laughs> yes. Well, I know I once had a professor who was a speech writer for one of our presidents. So I, I know the president isn't usually writing their own no. speeches or setting their own policies. So I guess that's why I thought, how do we know the interpreters aren't doing it? <laughs> no, no, they're not doing it. I can assure you of that. You know, and it's it's a very much undervalued uh, profession in this country. People don't understand what it requires. A lot of people say, well, you speak the language, you can translate this. No, you cannot. And I can always say something like, well, you speak the language, tell me you drive a car, tell me all the parts and how to work together. Why not? Why can't you do it? Unless you're a mechanic, of course, you know. But they cannot, but they expect us to know engineering and medical and chemical and everything else legal, you know, everything else in between without any preparation. You can't do that, you know. So it, it's, a, it's a tough job in this country, definitely. And if you do it, you do it for the love of the language. Well, I, I can't even fathom being able to listen to what they're saying while you're interpreting what mm -hmm. they how can you do that? How does your brain work to get both? <laughs> well, first of all, you start by shadowing, right? So they teach us to repeat what you say. Number one lesson, don't listen to yourself. Listen to the other person. Number two, you start shadowing. So once you start to talk, I start to talk first in English and then, which means you're very well versed in both languages because you have to keep up at the same time, right? Yeah. It, yeah. is, it, is it exhausting to do that kind of work? Yes, it is. And a lot of people don't realize that. It is. That's why the United Nations are always two interpreters in a booth and they relay each other every 20 minutes. But that is not what happens in a courtroom. And it's, it's very intense. They don't realize that we need a break. Wow. We once had a, a meeting of interpreters and... Um, the court, the court, the the person who organizes all the court interpreters, the way the word escapes me right now. See, I would be a poor interpreter right now because <laughs> the word just escaped me. But um, and he said he was not aware of that. I mean, for us to bring ch changes, you know, people don't think twice. Wow, it's a, it's very unfortunate. Yes, but it it requires a a great amount of expertise, definitely whether you do it in writing or speaking. In writing, as a translator, at least you have a time to look things up, but not as an interpreter. And you would be amazed how many attorneys don't even know the difference because they always translate. And then worse, we want you to translate every single word the way we say it. And you go, that's so nonsensical. <laughs> <laughs> because first of all, the order of the words are not the same, and you know, even with expressions, you know, you say, I, if I talk about um, the black screen of my white nights, what does that mean? Nothing in English. It's an expression meaning sleepless nights. So how am I going to say every word and not give the meaning? You see, you can only do meaning and intent. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And and <laughs> and then if they know two words and they start correcting us, it's even worse because they're not aware of all the nuances, you know. Well, I don't want to go on attorney bashing here, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have a tough job themselves. I as I know they work very hard too through the weekends and evenings, but still they could have a little more respect for our profession, I think. Anyway. That's a different subject than career transition, Ali. <laughs> so let's get back on track. Yes. So we're, your resumes have been featured in more than 35 books as well mm -hmm. as on careerjournal.com. Mm -hmm. And you're also featured in the book Stepping Stones to Success that yes. you authored with Deepak Chopra, Jack Canfield, and Dennis Waitley. Yes. What is your favorite topic? to share? 
my favorite topic to share to share excuse me is that today you don't have to be miserable at work with the pandemic the employment market landscape has changed drastically and there is no reason not to do what you love to do today and getting paid for it at the same time you know you can change you can have a whole new life with a lot less stress I mean, look, we all have a bad day at work sometimes, but overall, right, you have a much more enjoyable life. Less stress, lower blood pressure is the result of that, which means fewer diseases is the result of that. So you can really have a healthy life today and a better, I know it's a cliche by now, work-life balance, but there's a time to work and there's a time to enjoy life. And why not enjoy your family? You know, this uh, maybe if we all start doing it, we can change uh, the reasoning that is being used by employers in this country. You know, because they have no qualms of calling you after hours or on the weekend of heaven forbid you should have a day off. I mean, if you want employees. <sighs> to be more effective in their word, work, you should allow them to enjoy their life as well. You know, they, they in, in some, I think they have, they spoke about the Google culture uh, a while back where they allow their employees to go and play tennis or have a siesta in the afternoon because they come back refreshed with more energy. Right? So, you know, forcing you to work eight, 10, 12 hours a day nonstop with a half an hour break for lunch. Oh, please, it just takes you that long to go and get the lunch if you don't bring it with you. <laughs> you know, not even time to digest the food. This is not a good work environment, which is why I decided to niche for those people who are so miserable in their work into a career transition to help them get a new life. When you're working with somebody transitioning who's used to that kind of pressured environment, is it a bit of a challenge to help them create the new habit of it can't work nonstop? Like most entrepreneurs I know are working nonstop and they say it's because they're working for themselves, but they're working a lot more hours than they ever did for somebody else. So they're not really getting the benefits that you're talking of. So right. I'm imagining that you have a complete picture to make that right. happen. And it's true. In the beginning, maybe they have to work a little more, but it shouldn't be 10 years, <laughs> you know, maybe a year or two at the most, but still take breaks in between because people don't realize that you become ineffective if you don't take breaks, you know? Whether you work for yourself or for somebody else, it doesn't matter. You need breaks. You need the body to be able to be reset, you know, so you can move forward. And so sometimes it means changing your way of thinking. But what I like most about you, you ask me what I like about my work. I get to educate and nurture my clients. But I also, once they see a way out, because... I have to backtrack just a moment. A lot of people think this is all I've done my entire life. This is all I can do. No, you have many transferable skills. Now, you can't be a surgeon overnight. You cannot be an architect overnight. But they had a client she wanted to scuba dive, but she couldn't afford the classes. She was an administrative assistant. Well, that was fairly easy. Get an administrative assistant position at a scuba diving school. And then because you're part of the staff, you get a break and you get your classes and eventually she became a scuba diver, you know? Wow. I had a person, I had a gentleman who, um, also miserable in his job, obviously, was a project manager and he was working inside and he, and everything he showed me was outside. I said, what are you doing? He says, my dream was always to be a motorcycle race driver. Well, by the time he came to me, he was married to small children. So, you know, his wife wasn't going to allow him to do that. However, we were able to get him a position at a motorcycle racetrack. And so he worked in the aftermarket. And I'm sure the race drivers would allow him to 
get on their motorcycle once in a while. Nobody needed to know, right? <laughs> as long as he went home in one piece. But so you see what I mean? He got to work in the environment he wanted to work in, but slightly different than he originally thought. But it made such a world of difference to him, right? Yeah. So you, you, you have all kinds of things. I had a, a lady in her mid forties, also an administrative assistant who was laid off and thought she would never get rehired. And she became an entrepreneur. When we did the career exploration, it showed she could, she could very well be an entrepreneur. And this was a, a few years ago, she went into real estate, making more money she ever would have as an administrative assistant, but had time to go and take care of her elderly mother and her own family and, you know, so enjoy life. I mean, there's so many possibilities. And the, the, the high point for me is when I see my client's face begin to literally bloom when they see, ah, there's a way out, I can do something else. And it's like a new lease on life. You know, that's what I really need. That's very rewarding to me. It's a question of you can think outside the box. You can see what somebody who's stuck and feeling so pressured and stressed, just their mind can't go there at all. Mm -hmm. That's right. When I, I was a stay-at-home mom, if you can be a stay-at-home mom, I raised two performing kids. And I went in to... I, I guess she was called a career coach. This was back in the 80s. And I went in and she said, well, what skills do you have? And luckily I had my teenage daughter there with me. I said, I don't have any skills. And then she said, well, you don't have any skills. And then she listed, I ran the house. I was a professional volunteer. I had all kinds of skills that wasn't in my awareness. So your work is so important to assist people. And yes, do what makes you happy. And right. The message to drive home to everybody. That is correct. Yes, and you know, housewives, we really put down like we're nothing, right? But there are so many things we do. You know, we coordinate schedules. We get the children to one place and you don't get a place just about the same time. I mean, we're really magical. You have so many skills. You could so easily be a project manager. <laughs> but employers don't recognize that. You're, even, well, you're just a housewife. No, no, no. A lot of skills in there that many men could not do. Nothing against men. Men have other strong points, you know, but. Yeah, it's just, and look where we're going, unfortunately, backward again. <laughs> so, um, yes, if, if you've just been a housewife all your life, or most of your life, there are many possibilities for you. And we can certainly explore them together and get you on your way. Because, you know, there, there, there are preparing meals. You know, you could be a chef, maybe if you wanted to, although you might be tired at this point, not wanting to get your <laughs> eat all day, but coordinating, a coordinator in you know, so many things about special events, don't you organize birthday parties and all this stuff? I mean, <laughs> now I'm not saying every single person has all these skills, but everybody has skills, yeah. even as a housewife. You know? I believe we each have a talent that makes us special. For some mm -hmm. people, that talent is they can smile and light up a room. That's yes. important. So if you have somebody outside of you to point it out, I think that's a really important first step. And it sounds like you're good at that. Yep. Everybody's, everybody has something to contribute. Now, for some people, it's been so long and they've been pushed it so deep inside them, they don't want to remember what it is. So we have to go and unearth that, right? But once we have that unearthed, we can move forward and say, oh, there is absolutely no reason for anyone to be miserable today in what they're doing, all quites, you know? So, yes. You have such a powerful energy. What mm -hmm. drives you to make the choices you make, the come on with that bright, loving energy, sharing and caring. Do you know where it's coming from? 
I do where it's coming from. So I don't want to put <laughs> a, a dark spot on this uh, podcast, but all my life I've been told that I would never amount to anything. Oh. I was in a marriage where all I could be like nothing. If I didn't say yes to everything the husband said, yeah. very little for me. And um, one day I just realized that you know, if I am so incapable of doing anything, so stupid, so not, a, not able to do anything right, or any variation thereof, I go, why is it that I'm doing everything and he's just going to work and come home and play? So that was the, the awakening for me. And so um, I decided nobody else should feel that way. We all have value. And I did get to do what I wanted to do, and I still do because I love to teach, so now I educate, <laughs> and I still get to nurture my clients. You know, to me, that's important, to help other people along, not to feel that, because it's a terrible place to be. And so what I'm saying is you really have to believe in yourself. Nobody else can do it for you. Now, that doesn't mean it happened overnight, it did. <laughs> but it did, and because of that, I am here to encourage my clients to accomplish that a lot faster. To believe in themselves, get them on the right track. Yes. Awesome. Nobody should be put down. Nobody should be, what you call it, um, terrorized actually by, the, by your husband. Mm. You know? I mean, he never hit me, but he did plenty of mental and emotional damage. You know? <laughs> so anyway, go prove that, but that's okay. I don't care. I don't look to the past. I'm not going that way. I'm only moving forward. So, and that's what I want for my clients as well. And my energy came from believing in me. And now this late stage in life, I'm finally surrounded by people who keep encouraging me and who see the, you know, that I have something worthwhile to contribute. So that's all I can say. <laughs> grateful to you for doing what you do and i know that you're getting ready to launch a program would you share about that oh thank you yes uh it's about career transition and the first program is going to be live before it becomes an evergreen and it's starting on august 23rd this year uh, i'd like to have a group of of people together because they too can encourage them you know each other and we can have an exchange of ideas more so than one-on-one -on -one. although i don't mind one-on-one -on -one, but i think sometimes a group can be beneficial as well and uh to support each other very important the, see there's one thing you have to understand nobody can do it alone today nobody can do it alone today so you need people around you to support you and get you on uh, the path you were meant to be on. <laughs> right? and what is the best way for people to reach you, to contact you? Okay, so I am on LinkedIn and I uh, am my uh, website that is just being launched. I have a brand new website called reimagineyourcareernow.com. Okay, and I'll have all those links in the show notes. Thank you for a very thought-provoking chat you. with us. <laughs> and hopefully uh, everything that you said is what I believe and teach. I just don't do it as a career thing. And I'm sure that person who needed to hear it is listening now. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And keep doing what you're doing because the world needs you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Ali. I want to remind everybody that all these links will be in the show notes, you can, including the one for contacting me, because I want to talk with you and maybe okay. you'll be one of our guests. And uh, the book questions, how to be happy, healthy, and secure will be in there. Remember to join our Facebook group where you can make a friend, ask questions, see special offers, special videos that won't be up on our website. And by the way, the link for the website where you can see or hear any episode will also be in the show notes. Remember to enjoy, that's capital I-N. 
capital J-O-Y, every moment, because nothing happens out there. Everything happens within you, within your body, mind, spirit. You don't see out there. You don't hear out there. You don't taste, touch, or smell outside of you. And I look forward to being here with you next time.